Welcome to Electron Online, and our next topic on products of vectors is the cross product. And notice when we multiply a times b and use a little cross, that means the cross product, which is not the same as a dot product. We also call this thing the vector product. And the reason why we call the vector product is the result of the cross product is another vector. For example, graphically, let's say we have a plane. A plane can be in any direction. Let's say we have two vectors that are on that plane. Vector A and vector B are on that plane, and they make an angle between them. Let's call the angle theta. The result of that product, if I multiply A times B via the cross product, I get a third vector. Let's call it vector C. And the vector C will be perpendicular to A and perpendicular to B. That's what these symbols mean, a 90 degree angle between C and A and a 90 degree angle between C and B. So that means that no matter what the direction of the plane is, and we have two vectors on the plane, the cross product will always give you a vector that's perpendicular to the plane no matter what the direction of the plane is. So vector C will always be perpendicular to the plane made by vector A and vector B, regardless of the orientation of that plane and the orientation of vector A and vector B. All right, so first let's learn something about vector C. Let's go and learn about the magnitude of vector C. It turns out that the magnitude of vector C is equal to the magnitude of A, multiply it times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle between them. Now notice that if the angle between A and B is 90 degrees, and of course the sine of 90 degrees is 1, then the magnitude of C is simply A times B. But as the angle gets to be smaller than 90 degrees, let's say 45 degrees or 30 degrees or 10 degrees, the smaller the angle gets, the smaller the sine of that angle is, the smaller the magnitude of C. And in the end, if A and B are parallel, and the angle between them is zero, the sine of zero's core is zero, then the magnitude of C goes to zero as well. So the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product, depends on the length of A and B and the angle between the two. Now what happens if the angle gets to be gre greater or bigger than 90 degrees? Then of course, the sine of something bigger than 90 degrees becomes smaller again, and in the end, if the angle between them is 180 degrees, the sine of 180 degrees is zero, and again, the magnitude of C goes to zero. So that at least gives you something about the magnitude of C. What about the components of C? How do you find the vector C? Well, vector C will be equal to C sub x in the x direction, plus C sub y in the y direction, plus C sub z in the z direction. And the question then becomes, how do you find the x component, the y component, and the z component of that vector c, the resultant of the cross product of a times b? So if we, for example, go like this, we know we're going to get to c vector. How do we find those components? Well, it turns out c is going to be equal to the determinant i, j, k as the first three elements, and of course I use i, j, k there and I use x, y, z here, that doesn't do you a lot of good, so let me just use x, y, and z, doesn't matter what we use, x, y, and z. Then we put the components of the first vector, the a vector, which is a sub x, a sub y, and a sub z, and then we put the components for the b vector, b sub x, b sub y, and b sub z. So it's the result of that determinant which gives you the components of vector c. So what that means is, this is equal to, we take the first component, which is x hat, which is the unit vector in the x direction, times the product of the remaining determinant if we cross out the row and the column that this unit vector is in. So if we cross that out, we have those four elements left, and in here we put the product of those elements minus the product of those elements. So it would be a sub y, b sub z, minus a sub z, b sub y. Minus, so we go plus, minus, plus, the signs alternate, minus the next element in the first row, which is the unit vector in the y direction, times, and what we do now is we cross out all the elements in that row and all the elements in that column, and I have these four elements left, so it'll be the product of those two minus the product of those two. So that will give us a sub x 
times b sub z minus a sub z times b sub x. And finally, to get the third component of vector c, we take the third element in the first row, so now we go plus z hat, the unit vector in z direction, times, and again, we block out all of the elements in the row and all the elements in the column that z appears in, and now we have those four elements left, and we're going to take the product of those two minus the product of those two, so this would be a sub x, b sub y minus a sub y b sub x. And what that means is that this here will be the x component of our resultant vector. This here will be the negative of the y component of our resultant vector. And this here will be the z component of the resultant vector. So when we multiply a cross b using the cross product, I get a third vector, the c vector, and the c vector will be equal to c sub x, which is a y b z minus a z b y multiplied times the unit vector in the x direction. Then it'll be plus, now we have to be careful, there's a minus here. If I turn that into a plus, then of course I have to change the signs there. So maybe just to keep it simple, we'll just keep the minus um, the uh, a sub x b sub z minus a sub z b sub x in the y direction, the unit vector in the y direction, so it's probably better to do that. Then plus, finally we have a sub x b sub y minus a sub y b sub x, and that would be in the z direction. And this will be the vector, or the resultant vector, when you do a cross product. So we can find the magnitude, by doing this, this is the magnitude of the product, and this is the actual vector of the cross product. Now you may say, well, why do we have dot products and why do we have vector products? Well, it turns out in physics, there is a very real reason why we have both of those. There are occasions where to get the result of something, for example, if you want to find the work done by a force on an object, the work done is equal to the dot product of the force times the displacement. I'll just write D for displacement. And so it's a dot product and the result is a scalar quantity. The work done is just a number. I've done so many joules of work. In other cases, we need to find, for example, the force on a charge moving through a magnetic field. And the force on a charge moving through a magnetic field is equal to the cross product of the strength of the magnetic field times the velocity of the charged object through that field and it does depend upon the relative angle between the direction of the B field and the direction of the velocity and the force on an object is equal to the magnitude of those two vectors times the sine of the angle between them and so that means that if a object like a charged object moves parallel to a magnetic field and the angle is zero then the force is zero so you can see that there are some very real situations in which we're going to use dot products and cross products. As crazy as this seems, as strange as a dot or a cross product seems, there are some very real applications of this. And so remember, this is how you find the cross product. And to help you along a little bit, on our next video, we're going to show you an example of how to do a cross product using some numbers. So hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense when you look at that.